Hello everybody, I'm Jorga Maglaski. I am a partner and head of immigration at Deloitte. The publication of Migration Advisory Committee's report to the consultation issued by the government in relation to Tier 2 skilled migration was probably the most significant event in the UK immigration history. And I wanted to bring Sir David Metcalf to the Deloitte studio to talk us through the actual report, the summary findings and the proposals that have been suggested in the response. Let me ask Sir David to actually talk to us a little bit more about the actual role of the MAC and what does MAC do? Um, the MAC has been going since 2007 and we don't set our own homework. The government gives us a commission, it's, de it's determined across government, it's not just a Home Office commission, and we then set about the task. By and large, the government accepts the recommendations, but not always, and it is, of course, a matter for the government, not a matter for the MAC, yeah. to accept or to reject the recommendations. Is it correct to say that when the MAC is issued with the questions, you have to answer those questions, so you're, you need to stick to the brief? We are independent and we're evidence-driven, and if we thought that the question that we had been asked was a trivial or a silly question, we would actually say so. But actually, I and my colleagues on the Secretariat are very partially involved in the way the question is framed. It, isn't, it doesn't just come from thin air. Mm -hmm. And so by and large, we're very content with the commissions that we get. Was this different in terms of the, you know, the scale of the questions that were being asked of the MAC? This is indeed a major report, and it has got a host of recommendations um, some of which I think ought to be quite favourable to business and favourable to the government's aim of uh, cutting down on the numbers, but some I suspect business will not like because it will raise their costs. So David, you talked about cutting down the numbers, um, you know, it's an elephant in the room. Was that really the driving force in, in some of the recommendations? Presently the government has got an aim to get net migration down from the present 330,000 down to below 100,000. And our commission was absolutely unambiguous. It said, Mac, tell us how to substantially reduce economic migration from outside the EU, but simultaneously having regard to productivity and competitiveness. Yeah. Because skilled workers are good for productivity, they're good for competitiveness, but the government, there's a tension in the government's aims. Can you just tell us whether the response to the consultation was um, substantial? Did you get what you wanted out of these responses? We got over 200 responses and some of them were very substantial. I mean our businesses of course are very open and up, up front about uh, w what they would want out of the system and I think that the evidence that we got was, was very helpful. The face-to-face -face meetings that we had, my own view is we've done justice to the evidence but the evidence certainly informed, informed our report. I remember talking to you before the actual consultation and I remember you asking us to be very clear in evidence. If you are talking about not having enough talent, then please tell us how. How do you measure that? How can you prove this to us? So I hope sincerely that that came out. You've got to remember that the, the 20,700 figure, is, which is the, the capped amount, is only quite a very small component of the tier two. There's 150, an effective flow, including dependents, of 150,000 people. The uncapped components the intra-company transfers, the tier four switches, the student switches, the dependents are, are a much larger fraction than the capped amount. We've suggested that the automatic work rights of dependents remain. Yes. We, don't, we don't want to stop dependents working by and large. They're doing professional jobs. They're not displacing British workers. Uh, and we don't think there should be an automatic sunsetting clause for the occupations and job titles on the shortage list. There are certain themes that are coming out from, from the report and um, let's start from the salary threshold. I mean, what is the rationale behind this? What we're proposing is that the salary threshold should rise from the present min it's minimum threshold, 20,800 up to 30,000 pounds. The 20,800 dates from a time when the skill level required to come in under tier two was two A levels. The skill level since 2010 has been a graduate level, which is of course therefore a much higher level. And what we've done is we've taken the distribution of pay among graduates, and we've only gone for the 25th percentile, so the man or woman 25% from the bottom, 
that figure is 30,000. The minimum salary rise will most certainly have implications. The graduate recruitment is certainly going to feel that most significantly, but you did make some provisions. We've said in the July report and then subsequently that things like the milk round and so on, they should attract exemptions or, or, or special treatment. And we, the, although the, the overall minimum we're suggesting is 30,000, we suggest for new entrance figure, so that, that's within uh, three years of graduation and I think under 26, that the, the relevant figure should be 23,000. It does seem a lot about the costs, the costs of bringing migrants. The immigration skills charge was actually floated by the Prime Minister immediately after the election. Um, I mean, although it's a charge, it actually you could just as easily call it a subsidy because the proposed proposal is that you have, a, you have an amount for each migrant that you bring in and that goes into a pot and that then the, the money gets distributed to the firms doing the training. So the firms that are doing lots of training, they almost certainly would gain more than they would, would pay. Now, I have to emphasize this is a matter for the Treasury. It's not a matter for the MAC, but the MAC being economists and being independent-minded have a view on this. And what we're suggesting is that it should be high enough that affects, it affects behavior, but also raises revenue. So we're suggesting a thousand pounds per year so a three-year visa would cost £3,000, paid up front, and that goes into a pot. In rough and ready terms, our calculations are that that would raise £250 million mm. per annum. And that's a lot of money then to distribute to the firms that are doing the training. In a sense, much more important, in my view, is that it goes into the pot, boost the human capital overall by giving a grant to the the firms that do the training. In your um, response, you have considered the risks. For example, it may not work, so the numbers will not go down. There's another reference in talking about risks in that actually companies might choose to relocate. So you, you do address both of those points. I think that by and large, uh, most of the firms will uh, adjust a little bit. I mean, uh, quite how much, we, we don't know. It's impossible to know at this stage. I mean, we did a bit of modelling, but we didn't want to sort of chance our arm on something where it, where it was so uncertain. It, it was not robust uh, evidence. And yes, you're also correct that there is always some possibility of offshoring. I doubt that that will be a major issue. And frankly, I don't really think it, why the immigration skills charge would be a major theme in this, because I repeat that the firms that are doing the training will gain from this. Mm. I mean, they should welcome it. It is about saving costs. Companies are focused a lot on saving costs, so this will certainly not help them in that task. It, it may not help them absolutely immediately, but it may also encourage them, which is in part the purpose of this, to invest in British human capital rather more. And uh, I would have thought that almost everybody would welcome that. Mm. Shall we talk about the intra-company transfers? Yes, let's do that. In the Prime Minister's speech, he was absolutely unambiguous in the speech just after the election that he, he was exercised about uh, the, the firms that are not augmenting uh, British human capital. And so what we have suggested in this is that the, essentially that the government had to take a good look at this route. We, we think that the amount to be paid uh, for bringing these workers in should be substantially higher at 41,000. And there is a question of looking at allowances as well because we're, we're not expert in tax tax systems or tax law, but there there is some evidence, some suggestions that maybe the playing field is tilted against uh, the British workers. I should add on the intra company transfers that it was designed for senior managers and specialists. The way that it has evolved is it's now being used through the third party contracting on the IT work for everyday IT work. That is not the purpose of the route. Certainly when you talk about ICTs, and I think this will be extremely welcome, is your opinion that it should not be limited to a five-year period. We think that on the conventional route, as a minor recommendation, we suggested that the Home Office should look at this mm. and look at it sympathetically with a view to saying, you don't have an automatic five-year cut-off. You, you should make it a bit more flexible. Mm. And I know that the Home Office is sympathetic to this. Oh, that's good. That's very positive to hear. I don't suppose we said anything about the, um, the cooling off periods being cancelled. No, not, <laughs> not at this stage. That wasn't part of the report at no, this stage, no. no. One other thing you, you touched upon is the annual limit. 
And I'd like to hear your thoughts on the annual limited, because of course now that we are talking about in-country switching being captured by the limit, is there for room to increase it? What we thought is that it's a bit odd that somehow or other the people from outside have to be in a capped amount, whereas the people who switch sort of in, often students, but not, not always, it's others as well, um, in some sense get priority with, without having to be a, in a capped system. W what we suggested is not that the cap should remain at 20,700, but it should be extended. I have to say I'm not at all sure that this will get picked up by the Home Office or by the government. I mean, this was almost a, an aside for the MAC because we just thought it was, the whole thing was illogical. One other point that I wanted just to pick your brain on is this suggestion that perhaps we should be giving more information when issuing certificates of sponsorship. In particular, I'm referring to your suggestion of detailed job description. I think some people, perhaps because we weren't as clear in the report as we should have been, have slightly misread this. The proposal is so that we know quite what the person is, is doing. It isn't, it isn't in any sense so that the entry clearance officer or the people in Sheffield can say, oh, this person can't come in. That is, that is not the purpose. But right now, particularly to, in the IT world, a lot, of, a lot of the companies would just write, oh, programmer. Well, we want a much more detailed exposition of w quite w what the person actually will be doing. Partly so that you can check ex post when, when the Sheffield people do the monitoring. Um, and just so that you can build up an information system about the sorts of jobs that people are doing. What if we implement these changes and proposals and it doesn't work. What do we do then? I would expect that the numbers will fall somewhat, but you're quite right. In the total sum of things, the, the numbers that we're dealing with here are quite modest compared with, compared with what the government is trying to do to getting net migration down from the 330,000 that it is presently down to less than 100,000. The numbers are quite modest. It is one of the levers that the government has got to actually control migration and obviously the government wants to do the right thing, trying to get a balance I think between numbers but also productivity, also controls on public expenditure and I think that the MAC has made a sort of a modest contribution here to try to help them achieve this balance. How much of this do you think will be implemented? This is quite a major sort of package of recommendations and I mean everybody knows that there is it isn't a question of tension, but different views, for example, between the Home Office on the one hand and perhaps the Treasury and Biz on the other. And I would, my, I would anticipate that there will be uh, some discussions, possibly even negotiations. The Department of Health will have a view also about uh, the nurses' pay. And there'll be quite intense uh, discussions. But I do think that we've got to bear in mind both our commission MAC, tell us how to get the numbers of economic migrants from outside the EU down, which came directly out of the Prime Minister's speech. So I would expect that um, the lion's share of the recommendations to find favour, but it's not a matter for me or the MAC, it's a matter for our democratic elected government. Thank you very much, Sir David, for coming to talk to us at our Deloitte studio. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was all good fun and I look forward to the, uh, the seminar where I can see people face to face. Thank you very much everyone. I hope this was useful and we look forward to seeing you all on the 11th of February at our offices at Deloitte.